Hello and welcome. Hopefully, welcome back. This is uh, part three of a solo model kind of brief overview, and we're focusing on the solo diagram as well as uh, convergence dynamics. In the previous video, we discovered that there's a steady state value of capital um, in this model, uh, and then this one will kind of visualize that. We'll look at how uh, the model looks like, you know, graphically. Uh, and hopefully build a little bit of intuition there. And then we'll also use that solo diagram to discuss the convergence dynamics, like why is the steady state relevant to us? Uh, and why we, why do we think that, um, you know, if the model, say, were off that equilibrium, off that steady state, why would it converge towards the steady state value of capital? Um, so yeah, let's get started. So to get started, let's kind of review the model. So we just found out the steady state value of capital, K star here. The city state value of capital per worker is this. Uh, our law of motion equation is this. So this is how capital changes through time. Uh, our production function is defined by this. So uh, you know f of k is equal to total factor productivity times the uh, capital per worker raised to the alpha. Our investment or savings equation, you know i sub t is equal to the savings rate times output per worker. Uh, and then we're going to introduce a new concept here. So this is we're going to call break-even investment. So what is break-even investment in this situation? So suppose uh, we have some value of capital per worker, and suppose we wanted to keep that value constant. So not the steady state value. Uh, it's just asking, well, what is the investment required to keep the capital stock constant from one period to the next? Well, remember, the only thing that really destroys capital one period to the next is depreciation, right? So uh, this is savings. This is depreciation minus uh, the capital stock. So if we wanted to keep the capital stock constant from one period to the next, really the, the only thing we need to invest in, like the amount of investment, needs to perfectly offset uh, the amount of uh, capital that's, that's been depreciated. So given any value of capital, the break-even investment required uh, is going to be depreciation times the capital stock, right? So let's draw this first in the solo diagram to see what it means. And that's what I've striven to do here. So along the horizontal axis, we have capital per worker. Uh, and then along the, the vertical axis is actually going to be a couple of different things. So I'm actually, I'm going to be labeling it several different things, but for now it's going to be break even investment. Cool. So uh, the idea is, um, suppose you have a very low capital stock. If you wanted to keep that capital stock constant at that very low level, the idea is that the amount of investment that's required to keep that capital stock constant is very low. Suppose you had a capital stock way up over here at this end of the spectrum, uh, and suppose you wanted to keep that capital stock constant, well then investment required that period would have, would have to be larger as well. So exactly the amount of investment required to keep any, you know, for any arbitrary capital stock you wanted to keep constant, um, this line right here reflects the amount of capital required. So let me draw that in, label that correctly. Cool. So that is our idea of break-even investment. It's the, um, you know, given, say, like I'm pointing right down here at a value of capital per capita, if I wanted to keep that value constant, I need to invest this point as much, this as much. If I had uh, this point down here's amount of capital per worker and I wanted to keep that constant, I need my investment rate equal to be about right here. Great, so that's the first part of our solo diagram. The next one, uh, you can I mean, kind of see them grayed out in the back, is gonna be um, production, so aggregate production. Let's label that nice and red. Um, so this is our production function. Remember, our production function took the form of this. Sorry, actually took the form of this. So total factor productivity times k to the alpha. Um, the If you remember uh, from two videos ago where we went over the assumptions of the production function, like I mentioned, you know, I kind of described the shape of it uh, with the anodic conditions and with the uh, increasing but diminishing uh, marginal returns. That determines this concave shape of the production function. So where the horizontal axis for that line is output per worker. Uh, along the um, horizontal axis is capital. 
So at very low levels of capital per worker, we expect relatively low output per worker. At relatively high values of capital per worker, we expect relatively high values of output per worker. Um, exactly how those things are related to each other? Well, given any additional increase in capital per worker, we know output per worker is going to increase. So that's the increasing returns. Um, but it's a concave shape. So it's diminishing returns to additional capital per worker, hence the concave shape. Cool. And then the last part uh, is going to be our investment savings. This is actually really easy to draw because investment savings is just the savings rate. The savings rate is some number between 0 and 1, the percentage that people save of their income, times output per person. So it's exactly that line, the production function line, times whatever the savings rate happens to be. So I'm going to draw that in. You can kind of see that in the background. I have a nice little gray, gray outline for savings. Uh, I'll make it green. So uh, you notice that it's definitely always going to be below our output per person, right? Because the savings rate is some number between zero and one. If the savings rate were, um, you know, if, if people saved absolutely nothing, then that investment line would be um, exactly zero. Uh, if people saved uh, everything, save 100% of their income, then S is equal to one, and then the investment line would be exactly in line with the, the upward person. But realistically, we're going to have some savings rate between zero and one, so I'm just going to make it kind of look arbitrarily right there. Let me uh, label it. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry. So investment is equal to savings times output per person. So this is our solo diagram. Uh, you know, the vertical axis are these different scales. So you can just imagine numbers going along this, uh, and it's either break-even investment, output per person, or investment per, per worker. Um, and here are each of the lines. So uh, the other thing to note is this intersection, right? So remember the law of motion of capital equation, which was this guy right here. So capital changes through time. Uh, so the change in capital is equal to investment rate minus depreciation. So we found the, um, the steady state value of uh, capital per worker by setting this equal to zero, the change in capital is zero in the steady state, right? And then um, given our values for output per person and you know, turning this into the steady state value, we then found this. So what we did is we, it's the steady state value of, um, of uh, capital per person is the value such that investment equals depreciation. And well, we just drew in lines. We have an investment line, and then we have that break-even investment line. So we could actually see the steady state value of capital per worker here, right at the intersection of our break-even investment line and our uh, investment line. So the steady state value of capital per worker is exactly right here. So let me label it up for you. Cool. So defined by our steady state values, where these two lines intersect, the investment line and then uh, the break-even investment line, that is our steady state value of capital per worker. It's cool. But uh, remember, given um, that we have a steady state value of capital per worker, uh, remember that output per worker, right, y sub t is equal is uh, just a function of capital per worker, right? Uh, given our Cobb-Douglas production function, that was just uh, a times k sub t to the alpha. So um, alpha is a constant. Total factor productivity in our simple model is a constant. So we could actually rewrite all of this uh, and get a steady state value of output per worker as well. So what does that look like? That looks like the following. So um, our steady state value of output per worker is going to be equal to this. It, uh, it's just you plug in the set to value of capital per worker. Oops. Sorry. Awesome. So what does that look like on the solo diagram? Well, what you do is you take the set to value of capital per worker, and then you see where that takes you to the production function. So this value, this point right here, is our steady state value of output per person. So yeah, this is graphically where our steady state value of capital per worker is. Um, so next, let's discuss convergence. So uh, convergence. Uh, 
you know, why do we think the steady state is important? Well, think if you're off the steady state, right? So let's suppose you're not at the steady state value of capital per worker and output per worker. Let's suppose that you're some lower value down here. So let's suppose that you have some capital stock anywhere between zero and um, just below the steady state value of capital per worker. Um, what happens, right? You know, what, how can we maybe describe what's going on? Well, note that at any point down here, this uh, green line is above our yellow line. The green line represents investment in this period, and the yellow line represents the amount of capital required to be invested in order to keep investment constant, right? So that's basically this right here. So um, the difference between the green line and the yellow line is investment minus break-even investment. Um, so at any point down here, because of the shape of our production function and investment line, uh, if this investment is above uh, break-even investment, then delta K is going to be positive because investment is above the amount of investment required to keep capital constant. So we know delta K is going to be positive, which means if we're at any point of capital worker down here, delta K is going to be positive. So we're going to get a positive change in capital from one period to the next. So if you happen to start off down here, you're going to see convergence towards the city state value of capital per worker. And then a similar process works with any value of capital per worker above that city state value. So suppose we start off with capital worker way, way, way up here. You can see that the break even investment line is above investment. So that means this delta K is greater than uh, investment here, uh, which means that our delta K, the change in capital is going to be negative. So if we start off over here, um, the next period we're going to some, by some amount reduce capital per worker. So the idea of a convergence is that if you're off the steady state, things are set up to converge towards the steady state. Uh, there is one exception, and that exception is right about here. So there's technically a, another steady state value, and that's where cap capital and labor are equal to zero. Um, I had one professor who would like to, I think that was like a trick bonus question on one of the midterms. So like uh, they ask you, you know, to do all the boilerplate stuff, solve for the steady state value, uh, and then they asked you, uh, he asked you to uh, mention another one, and the answer was just capital and labor were zero. Um, in fact, sometimes if people don't word their their exams well, they say find the steady find the steady state value um, in this model. You could just say capital and labor equals zero, but you'll probably get marked for that, or maybe not. I don't know. Whatever. Anyway, so that's the idea of convergence. Um, things are set up to converge towards that steady state value. Oh, yeah, the other cool thing is, um, remember, delta K, so how much capital changes from one period to the next, is equal to this. So delta K could be small or it could be large, right? Uh, the size of the move of in capital per worker depends on the difference between these two. So suppose we're at this value right here. You can see that investment is quite a bit bigger than the break-even investment required to keep capital per worker constant. So if we happen to be at this point, the change in capital is the difference between this and this. So that's a fairly large change. Uh, and so if we were at this point, we'd see capital move up quite a bit. However, suppose we were somewhere over here, uh, the difference between investment and breaking investment required uh, to keep capital per worker constant is very, very small. So the difference between these two is very, very small, and therefore our change in capital is very small. So the idea is um, if we're starting off way, way over here, um, you'll have fast, big moves in capital per worker towards the steady state, but as we approach it, it'll the incremental moves from one period to the next will be smaller and smaller and smaller. So you have initial fast moves and then smaller moves. And you have a similar thing over here where um, uh, if break-even investment required is significantly larger than investment, the initial moves, if we start way, way over here, will be very large reductions in capital per worker. But as capital per worker approaches the steady state, the moves will be smaller and smaller and smaller. And then I'll show you that. I'll see that in detail. You'll see that in detail when I draw the time series graphs of how these things could converge towards the city state. In fact, I might as well do that now. So that's uh, the initial idea of convergence. You know what? I'm going to do that in the next graph, in the next video. So we'll discuss convergence in time series uh, in a second. Hopefully this was helpful. Um, if it was, if you found it helpful, be sure to give a thumbs up. And uh, thanks and have a good day. Bye.